Amidst the chaos of the 2023 OGL crisis, we were hit from seemingly out of nowhere with a little TTRPG Kickstarter that could. When it felt like there was no light at the end of the tunnel for our hobby, we watched as Shadow Dark greeted us from the inky blackness that surrounded us, delivering not peace, but a sword. It made the promise of an old school feel that wouldn't feel alienating in play to modern TTRPG fans and wasn't afraid to bare its teeth in its generous system preview quick start. The Kickstarter funded for over $1,300,000 and received coverage in mainstream news outlets. A year later, we finally have the darkness in our hands, and I'm happy to say that the hype is not only real, it's probably understated. However, before we get too far into this thing, I want to give a disclaimer. The designer, Kelsey Dion, is someone I consider to be a friend, but she hasn't ever asked me for coverage in any way. I wanted to do this because I love talking about cool games, design, and the philosophy of how we discuss these TRPGs, and Shadow Dark honestly provokes a lot of interesting points about all these topics. So, if you're cool with that, I hope you enjoyed this discussion because I love dissecting this thing and I'm unbelievably happy that I backed it. Now, before we get into all that, I'm stoked to say that the fine coffee locks at Mini Worlds Tavern are the sponsors of today's video. If you've watched any of my streams, you know how crucial coffee is to my creative output. And honestly, if I could choose a single roast to fill my mornings for the rest of my life, it would have to be Mini World's Long Dark Great Old One. It's a primo, caramel sweet punch with a dark chocolate flourish that never overstays its welcome. If you prefer something on the light roast end, their Dragon's Nest delivers on its promise of an adventurous brew with its surprisingly tea-like notes and citrus hints. By the time you feel like you're starting to comprehend its flavor profile, you'll find yourself at the bottom of your mug looking for more. They also accommodate more classic coffee drinkers with their homely house blend if you're the kind of person who appreciates a cozy pair of socks and starting your campaign in a tavern. Many Worlds Tavern also donates $1 of every product sale to Tabletop Gamers, a nonprofit organization whose mission is promoting diversity, equity, and inclusion by championing the visibility and recognition of the LGBTQ community through tabletop gaming. Many Worlds Tavern isn't just a gimmick, they're genuinely a fantastic coffee company who just so happens to be run by nerds like us. Check out the link in the description to get yourself a bag delivered straight to your door, and while you're at it, check out one of their free adventures. Many thanks to Many Worlds Tavern for sponsoring, and with that, let's get on to the video. I was thinking about this format I'm building out around what had initially started as TTRPG reviews. I love doing this as more like a video essay format, so I'm going to lean hard in that direction. You'll be getting a lot of the meat of a review in these kinds of videos, but I want to use them more as vehicles for discussions on game design and our hobby, rather than just the game at hand. In particular, Shadow Dark brings up so many thought-provoking points on design from reduction and the sort of public zeitgeist around how we even talk about tabletop role-playing. It's sad to think that D&D's dominance mean that we always have to use it as a point of comparison, especially when Shadow Dark is so much more accessible than D&D ever has been in its half-century reign of terror. Now, while Shadow Dark has been praised as a gateway game for D&D 5e fans to the OSR, it hasn't really gotten its flowers for its strength as an introductory system to TTRPGs on its own merit. I understand why people feel this way, but I don't think it's entirely apt to treat 5e as the gateway to Shadow Dark, while Shadow Dark has an objectively better first-time user experience than 5e. After I do a quick system overview, I want to talk about the why behind why we bring up D&D and how they can demean some games and cause us to keep newcomers from learning about all these creative experiences beyond D&D. So let's do a brief overview about what you need to know to play. First off, you're going to need some of these polyhedral dice that should run. Well, that does not look great. <laughs> yeah, some of these dice right here. You're going to need some of these polyhedral dice that should run you about four to ten dollars that you can pick up at basically any local game shop or on Amazon. There's going to be a four, six, eight, ten percent, twelve and twenty sided dice. You're going to want something to write with and the Shadow Dark character sheet, which you can get through the link that I provided down below. You'll also need either the free Shadow Dark Quick Start in the following link or the official book. You may also want a phone with a timer to track this game's torch mechanic. So this is what we call a tabletop role playing game or TTRPG for short. It's a collaborative storytelling game where you and about three to five of your friends or some randos online meet up with a game master to explore a world that either the game designer or game master creates. The players are characters in this world and the GM controls all of the NPCs or non-player characters monsters, and the environment. Your character has an ancestry like human, elf, or dwarf, a class with the fighter, thief, cleric, and wizard being in the base game, and a background which is a quick summary of what you did before adventuring. Your ancestry and class will give you what's called talents, 
things that slightly bend the rules of the game in ways that are intended to be thematic to the character option. The GM, at short for Game Master, uses these things to create challenges for your character to overcome, testing your ability to think on your feet and use what the game gives you to figure out solutions. The objective isn't to win, it's to tell a story on the fly using the game's themes and mechanics, which we'll get to here in just a little bit. In this case, Shadow Dark is a grim and gritty fantasy dungeon crawler that emphasizes survival elements like Darkest Dungeon or Diablo. This one sits on the deadlier side for a TTRPG, but making a character is so quick and easy that it isn't a huge bummer whenever death happens. If anything, take the new guy that mysteriously appears from the shadows with a brand new equipment and raid your last one's corpse. When you go into these areas of danger and darkness, your character is going to want to have a torch handy. The way that Shadow Dark handles this is by setting a real world timer for one hour, emphasizing the need to press on instead of dawdling somewhere for a moment of reprieve mid-dungeon. Choosing to set up camp to rest requires three torches, so there's this interesting trade-off that happens where you have to choose if you want safety to explore or the ability to rest. This is definitely one of Shadow Dark's more board gamey elements, where most other TTRPGs are going to handle this in game world time instead. But this torch mechanic has the benefit of being more intuitive than narrative time for newer players, and it gives a real perceivable threat to the game akin to how John Harper implements progress clocks in Blades in the Dark. You have a visual concept of a looming threat in an area, which influences the decisions you'll make as a player. Right, resolution. So, how do we do things in Shadow Dark? This is a d20 roll high system. So you're trying to roll this 20-sided die and adding a number called a modifier to the roll that the GM calls for. The GM is going to compare that result to a difficulty check, a threshold for the difficulty of the thing that you're trying to do. It puts the threshold for normal difficulty at about a 12, so if the number that you roll in the d20 is equal to or higher than the dc, you'll succeed at what you're trying to do. There aren't any skills, and you're likely only adding a single bonus from anywhere on a d20 roll. In Shadow Dark, you know that you're good at a thing if you have advantage on a specific kind of roll, such as the thief's advantage to hide. For you newcomers out there, advantage is when you roll two d20s and use the higher of the two rolls. Disadvantage is the opposite, where you're going to roll two d20s and use the lower of the two rolls. Your overall chance of success on a standard roll is about 40% unmodified, increasing to about 58.5% if you have advantage. In a way, this is encouraging you to find solutions to problems outside of checks rather than fishing for success by gaming the game. This is one of those things that gives Shadow Dark its old school vibe, where players are encouraged to come up with sensical answers for solutions rather than chance how they'll do to a random roll of the die. In combat, you'll be making these checks to attack things and react to the enemies, and while exploring, you're going to be doing the same, but to do things like forage for food, find tracks, and other interactions that you can think of. Going over to your character sheet, we're going to need to generate your stats. To do so here, you're going to roll 3d6- FUCK! <laughs> Just about threw that in my coffee! Going over to your character sheet, we're going to need to generate your stats. To do so here, you'll roll 3d6 in order. Once you have the stat, you determine the modifier by consulting the table on page 15. This is a standard calculation for TTRPGs of stat minus 10, then divide that result by 2, but this time it has a hard cap of a plus 4 at 18 and higher. These modifiers are the numbers that you're going to add to your d20 rolls when the GM asks for a check. Now, keep in mind that you're only going to be adding this number to the d20 roll here, not the other dice that you might roll for some other elements of the game like damage. I will say, if you consider a character with only 13s or lower to not be a viable character, you're going to wind up re-rolling around 32.6% of the characters that you make. Re-rolling is of course an option, but I've seen how some players can react to seeing lots of negatives to their rolls. Sorry if I have a hard time imagining how to be a little bitch, Mr. Two Apology Videos in six months. Sit down and sell coffee. The game's grittiness is a factor here in the math. You're not making a lot of checks to fish for answers and have the dice play the game for you. The challenges set by the GM are supposed to make you think about how to overcome them rather than just see if you can randomly roll over a certain number. Try to avoid rolls resulting in a no answer and always aim for the no but and the no ands. GMs out there, I know that this can be a little hard to really click from the description alone, but keep this in mind whenever you're running Shadow Dark as it helps to deliver on the survivalist mindset the players are supposed to keep up. It also helps to cut down on what I call the LOL so random XD type of tabletop play where Players just ask to use a certain skill rather than propose an idea that you think prompts a check. Now, your table is going to be creating either first level characters or a handful of zero level peasants to put through a gauntlet, 
similar to the infamous Death Funnel from Dungeon Crawl Classics. If your character comes out the other end of the gauntlet, they're going to graduate to first level and take a class. The base game comes with the standard four classes of Fighter, Priest, Thief, and Wizard, each of which grants you weapons and armor that you can use, and you'll gain the class talents by randomly rolling on the class's talent table when you level up. Right, now the action economy. So whenever you're fighting or exploring, you'll have your action and your move. Your action is for certain things like attacking or casting spells, and your move is for repositioning yourself or to do specific maneuvers like reloading a crossbow. There isn't a loading screen in between combat and exploration to handle the fiddly bits of figuring out who goes first. You jump right into the action of a fight and pop right back out without feeling like you're playing a different game. If your character ever reaches zero health, you'll die in 1d4 plus your constitution modifier rounds, and at the start of your turn while dying, you'll roll a d20. If you roll a 20 on this d20, you rise with one hit point. Otherwise, you'll die when this round timer runs out unless you're stabilized. At that point, it's time to roll up a new character, which luckily takes all of about a minute to do, and you'll rejoin the party as soon as possible. For measuring positions when you need, Shadow Dark's distance is a key ingredient to its success in Theater of the Mind. It allows for quick rulings and a spatial abstraction that doesn't pressure you into grid-based measurements for rule legitimacy. You're not getting a lessening of the grid-based tactical play, you're just seeing that it doesn't need to be so specific. Those of you who prefer the crunch of exact specifics might be left a little bit wanting here, but distances have the added benefit of helping to remove some of the measurement system barriers for our friends who didn't bend the knee to the British Parliament by signing up for the nonsense that is Imperial measuring. Distance is a simple close near far keywording. This is an effective choice, but some of the wording can sort of trip you up when you read something like, you can move up to near. I know that I tripped up a couple of times whenever I was trying to visualize this, but once you remember distance and mechanical text is always in relation to the subject being discussed, typically you, it stops making you double take as much. Close is essentially within your reach, near is about up to 30 feet, and far is most distance beyond that but still within sight. The positioning here is intended to loosely capture the space of a scene without feeling anxiety over the game falling apart if you miscalculate something. Think not so much of a grid like Fire Emblem or Civilization, and more like an action game like Zelda or Elden Ring. The tactics are present, but they're not impeding the cinematics. From there, it's just about asking questions. If you're ever unsure about what to do, just ask questions about the situation. It's the GM's job to provide a scenario that's interesting enough to pique your curiosity and spawn questions naturally. This back and forth fuels the improvisation and keeps our story moving forward. Speaking of story, let's talk about the book. So this is a murdered out hardback with heavier paper stock, Smith's own binding, and a black silk ribbon. The chapter tabs can be seen on the foredge, allowing you to quickly reference separate sections even when closed. The artwork maintains the black and white old school feel, with some unique twists thrown in here by the likes of Lucas Court, Fringe Gilheim, who's Hanker and Fernell or Runehammer here on YouTube, Kelsey's wife, Jesse Egan, Yuri Perkowski Domingos, Matt Morrow, Matt Ray, Mark Lyons, and Abdul Latif. I particularly love Lucas Court's work that, while within the old school aesthetic, inserts the twist blend of Junji Ito and H.R. Geiger inspirations that pull the tone further from fantasy, but not so far into the darkness of horror. I've seen some people ding this as a big thick boy TTRPG that they're never going to be able to get their table to actually learn. It just seems like it's super intimidating because, oh look, it's a big old chunker, right? Now, here's the thing. It's only about the first like 100 pages that are player facing, right? These are the character options right in here. The rest of the book's 325 page count is a suite of tools and advice for game masters such as random tables. In the future, I think an incredible product for Shadow Dark would be something similar to Mothership's Player Survival Guide. This isn't a ding against the system because we literally just got the first print run in our hands, but another format that I'd really love to see are these more condensed quick start style zine even things. I love this so much. Like, you know everything about the game right here for a player character. I can buy four of these for the price of a single one of these. Like, look, this is just one of the best consumer like focus products I've ever seen. Yeah. Again, it's just another format that I'd love to see more games do, especially if a $15 player's guide gets the game to more people. When it comes to the question of whether Shadow Dark is suitable for extended fantasy epic style campaigns that's sort of mixed, the system is more focused on tighter low-level experiences rather than a campaign that spans multiple years every week. We all know that these kinds of campaigns are extremely rare to ever find anyways, so 
The scope is mostly centered on where 99.999% of practical play occurs. Whether or not Shadow Dark is your TTRPG of choice doesn't really matter because it's not trying to be the kind of game to dominate over other options. It's one way to experience a dungeon crawl in the same way Troika is one way to experience Gonzo Dream Logic storytelling, or Alien RPG is one way to experience space horror survival. The design principles on show here with lethality, character creation, and GM principles of common sense rulings over rules root Shadow Dark more in the old school vibe than modern systems bloated with rules for every interaction. Its OSR principles and 5e mechanical feel makes Shadow Dark a great gateway game for D&D 5e players to the OSR. Shadow Dark, Dark is a gateway game for D&D 5e players Shadow Dark is a gateway game for D&D 5e Shadow Dark is a gateway game for D&D 5e players to the OSR. Shadow Dark is a gateway game for D&D 5e players to the OSR. Shadow Dark is a gateway game for D&D 5e players to the OSR. Shadow Dark is a gateway game for D&D 5e players to the OSR. Shadow Dark is a gateway game for D&D 5e players to the OSR. Shadow Dark is a gateway game for D&D 5e players to the OSR. Shadow Dark is a gateway game for D&D 5e players to the OSR. Shadow Dark is a gateway game for D&D 5e players to the OSR. Shadow Dark is a gateway game for D&D 5e players to the OSR. Shadow Dark is a gateway game for D&D 5e players to the OSR. Shadow Dark is a gateway game for D&D 5e players to the OSR. Shadow Dark is a gateway game for D&D 5e the reasons why we say statements like this and all its synonymous spins. I'm not faulting content creators for saying this because it is an agreeable observation and in more cases than not, it comes from a place of good intentions. Yeah, of course, the already established TTRPG players who know 5e can accessibly see what this other category of role-playing games has to offer. But this sentiment is more loaded with questions and answers, particularly about the way that our hobby talks about itself. Try to read these statements through the lens of someone whose only knowledge of TTRPGs is that Dungeons & Dragons is that goblin dice game those kids on the Stranger Things are playing. This statement doesn't effectively communicate the quality of Shadow Dark on its own merits, and even assumes it's just an intermediary to something else. Even as someone who has a career in TTRPGs, I'm still fuzzy on what this is really trying to say. If I play this, I'll eventually stop playing this and be drawn to an OSR game? Oh, okay. So why don't I just skip the Shadow Dark thing and go play whatever that OSR game is? Is an OSR game an old school game like Advanced Dungeons and Dragons? Or maybe is it this Cairn thing? Wait, why is it whenever I Google the OSR, I see threads talking about Nazis, anti-wokers, Gamergate, and other bigotry within it? Is Shadow Dark the alt-right pipeline? Am I being red-pilled? Is Kelsey Dion a Nazi? All right, so let's tackle this OSR thing. We have this really bad habit of acronyming or slinging everything once we're in the know on a subject. but. That's not just a TTRPG problem, it's a human problem. We seem to be adverse to doing anything that requires us to move our tongue more than twice to complete. When we constantly shorten every term, we make it harder for people to understand what we mean. Why do you think militaries have used ciphers to transmit messages? It's to make themselves harder to be understood by people who aren't in the know. It's verbal gatekeeping. OSR, NSR, FKR, DCC, MCDM, RPG, TOTV, IRS, COTC, NFT, CIA, CAQ, BDSM, DNR, HTML, FBI, fucking TTRPG. We go out of the way to make ourselves harder to understand. This is probably a huge trend in the TTRPG scene because so many games are trying to get the D&D &D snap and sex appeal, but it also leads to a ton of confusion for first time users. This over acronymization is compulsive, but it's a natural human behavior. However, if you're a big fan of a thing and you want to welcome newcomers into your fandom, it might be a good practice to break down terms and say titles completely. This is also a pretty big boon to these games' searchability for Google's SEO, so you're actually helping a game designer with online discovery when you do. I wonder how many people Googled how to RPG and stumbled across Fred's channel when they were actually looking up a tutorial on how to fire a rocket propelled grenade? Probably zero, but I love imagining that specific scenario. So as far as the OSR goes, the definition has been pretty loose, and it really depends on who you ask. To illustrate this point, I called in a favor, or 12, from various TTRPG personalities with all kinds of varying experience and perspectives with the OSR. So depending on who you ask, the OSR is the old school revival, but I really think that term, the revival part, is just either playing <laughs> basic D&D or OD&D or advanced D&D, or republishing those rules almost word for word, but oftentimes like cleaner and with better layout is what people will say. The old school renaissance is what I really think of when I hear and see people talking about the OSR. This renaissance is truly a reimagining and rebirth of principles from those games. Generally speaking, the game is your own, make it your own, interpret these rules however you want to. And that's why so many OSR games are so minimal as well. They can be really short, really cleanly written, and really easy to read for that reason. But where that is kind of an absence of rules, the 
tangible element of the rules that is there and common, besides just being weak at level one, is the fact that player characters are often relying heavily on the equipment that they bring with them. That can mean magic items, uh, but it's often mundane equipment, and it is a contrast to modern versions of Dungeons and & Dragons and other role-playing games where you're really just a superhero. I actually had to look up what OSR even means. The OSR is old school revival or old school renaissance. And from what I saw, it basically means adhering to the earlier form of the game. That meant characters were possibly less powerful. Situations were more dangerous. It was more likely that a player dies. There were fewer mechanics for decision making. It was more on the DM to decide what could be done or not. I just had an interesting conversation with a friend of mine uh, where I labeled something OSR and they said, is that OSR? And I said, what is OSR? And we both kind of shrugged our shoulders. Originally, I think the OSR was all of the funny little house rules that people had in the 70s and 80s playing D&D. So if you were in Southern United States and you went up to uh, California and you played D&D there, all of a sudden they're like, well, we handle death like this or we handle loot like this. And it was a way to kind of not unify, but like codify all of that through blogs so that people could be like, oh, that's an interesting way of playing. Um, an old school way. OSR stands for Old School Renaissance or Old School Revival. They are a genre of games based on older versions of Dungeons and Dragons, particularly the Maldvay Cook Basic Expert set from 1980. This is the version I learned to play with, and the movement began in the early 2000s with the birth of the OGL, which allowed publishers to rewrite older versions of the game. And these games are simpler and much faster. Character creation takes about five minutes. You don't have all the multi-classing. Characters die at zero hit points, so they're much more lethal and less forgiving. And monster stat blocks are a lot simpler, making encounters easier and faster to run. A battle that takes an hour in five-year Pathfinder might take only 20 minutes in an old-school game, allowing you to play more game in less time. And the scenarios, and if you want a good one, you should check out Halls of the Blood King by my friend Diogo Noguera. They tend to be more open-ended and sandboxy as opposed to the more linear adventure paths you see today. I actually have no idea what OSR is, and in fact, I only have ever heard of it when I was asked this question. Don't hate me. <laughs> OSR games are games that try to get as close as possible to the feel of early TTRPGs from the 70s. But I must have been busy with something else in the 70s because I'm not always sure what that entails. So for example, the first two OSR games I played are so different from each other. But if there is similarities, it is that they are very quick paced and very lethal. From my understanding of the OSR, is that it's a style of tabletop game that aims to bring back the feeling of dungeon crawling adventuring that kicked off the tabletop scene in the first place, but with modern sensibilities. While many fantasy games aim to make players feel like big damn heroes saving the world, the OSR instead gets back to the nitty gritty survivalist fantasy from tabletop games of the past. OSR is old school and then something that starts with R. We had Ben Milton on uh, Wolf for Combat, who is the creator of the Nave RPG from OSR and does a ton of OSR YouTubing, who said that the R can be split into roughly two camps that each have different opinions about what OSR is, and that the R either stands for revival or renaissance, roughly. There are other R words, but the sentiment is either revival or renaissance. Revival would mean uh, people who think this is going to be mostly similar to a clone of old editions of Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, it's thus reviving um, the old school. Old school Renaissance folks are more thinking, let's bring in some of those same feelings and components that made gaming in those older editions so great. Even if the new game doesn't have all of the trappings that you might expect from something that's close to an old edition of Dungeons and Dragons. So an old school renaissance game would generally have emergent gameplay through random tables. It would have um, GMs 
making rulings based on clever ideas that the players have rather than a character solving the problem on their own due to their innate capabilities and other sorts of features like that, even if a Renaissance game might not even use a D20, it could use something else. What is the OSR? That is a difficult question to answer because no one really agrees on an answer to that. There's a lot of sub-factions and groups within the OSR that would say that it is different things. To some people, it's really about reviving the early rules of the game. So original, basic, expert, advanced D&D and bringing those rules and that gameplay back. Uh, to other people, I would say myself included, it's really more of a style of play that uh, focuses on things like having very player-led gameplay instead of GM-led gameplay, no plots, very open worlds, uh, a lot of creativity in terms of the problem solving. So it focuses on challenging the players more than the characters to overcome obstacles that don't have one scripted solution. The OSR also tends to have a very strong DIY attitude where you create your own worlds, you make your own rules, you share them online, you borrow them from other people, and you cobble together something that is yours and that fits what you want and what your players want. All right, so we're settled without dispute on old school, but there's a bit of a split on the R. Does it mean revival or renaissance? Riffing off of Ben, Bob, and Professor Dungeon Master's points, there's definite factions within this category that all make some claim towards old school admiration. I personally like to think that both things are equally correct here, but just saying different things. It's what the old school application means that distinguishes them. So why the old school admiration and why the divide? All right, so story time. Going back to its roots, the first release of D&D, often called the White Box, was actually a supplement for the war game Chainmail. They designed the D&D White Box with the assumption that the only people who would play D&D would already know how to play another game. This is a bit of foreshadowing right here. Now, when TSR decided to make D&D its own thing, there was the 1977 simultaneous release of Advanced Dungeons & Dragons, what you would call First Edition now, and the basic rules, sometimes called the Holmes Edit. While this was D&D's first step forward as its own thing, this version of the basic rules is a visual nightmare for layout, the information sorting, and rules conveyance. They were still figuring this stuff out and were likely working on an Apple II at best, but it's inarguably rough on the eyes. Fast forward to 1981. Tom Moldvay worked with TSR to create what we know today as Basic Expert, or BX for short. These were the ones that you saw Professor Dungeon Master holding up. Note that this is actually two books. I know that this kind of tripped me up whenever I was first getting to know all this stuff. But this version of the game focused on delivering the information as clearly as possible and made no assumptions of a reader's experience. This is what we call an accessibility pass. Some rules have been revised for clarity, and you were told the purpose of the play tools like dice right up front. The columns of the information are broken up by bolded headers and keywords, and this looks like a game. But I want to make note of something here. It's not just that this is an old version of something, this is a basic version of D&D. The presentation and overall modularity of character options is sparse. I think focusing on the age is the wrong way to give the old school renaissance its moniker, considering the rules light rulings heavy nature of the movement. There's a bit more procedure to the experience, making the game feel a bit more confident about taking the lead instead of the DM. Moldvay's editing down of the core rules was a form of reductive design, whether intentional or not. To me, at least, if I might be so presumptive, the difference between Renaissance and Revival comes more so down to what the game is trying to do. OSR as in Renaissance indicates a game designed with a focus on practical play rather than an iteration on an old school system. They try to present themselves as toolkits for making rulings instead of hard coding everything that might happen. Renaissance games are almost always rules light as a study in what you can take away from a concept while still delivering on the adventure game mouthfeel. This is where I'd see Knave, Morkborg, and Shadow Dark sitting fairly comfortably. But I want to note that this isn't like just any TTRPGs, because I wouldn't consider something like Spencer Campbell's Rune or Greg Leatherman's Glitter Hearts OSR games. They deviate from the basic expert resolution mechanics a little bit too much, because once you get out of the realm of rolling d20s for checks, that's where I feel like things get distinctly non-Renaissance. OSR is in Revival feels a bit more like an appreciation specifically for old RPGs rather than old school design philosophy. This is the more tradition and nostalgia line category with old school essentials or basic fantasy role playing likely being the most famous non D&D systems in the Revival. Well, this all sounds like rather mundane nerd shit. There's a split in the mindset that we can easily contribute to a semantic disagreement over the identification of a decentralized movement. This wouldn't be the first time that that's ever happened, but 
where's all this talk of right-wing extremism coming from? As with any movement that doesn't have a strictly defined code or established figurehead, the OSR has had people with an agenda attempt to claim authority over it. This has essentially been relegated to the nostalgia-aligned side of the OSR, but it only really exists in the fringe. Since social media is what it is, anyone who spams a hashtag or makes a website with even poor search engine optimization on a niche subject can have some measure of control over the messaging. When we leave newbie enlightenment up to a Google search dart throw, they're going to get hundreds of interpretations and potentially walk away having formed a bias for the unfair disparagement it gets as a haven for bigotry. To illustrate this point, I asked those same TTRPG creators, what do you think the majority of the TTRPG fandom's opinion is of the OSR? What do I think the TTRPG fandom's opinion of the OSR is? I'm not totally sure anymore. I don't follow a lot of those Twitter accounts. I'm just much less online than I used to be in that sphere. My general impression is that it is much more accepted and is much more part of the mainstream of role-playing games. It's definitely one of the best-selling categories on Drive-Thru RPG. I know a couple of years ago, the OSR won like 25% of all of the Any Awards one year. So it definitely ha has a lot more mainstream attraction and mainstream popularity than it did even five you know, to 10 years ago. I remember going back to, to those periods when it was super frequent to see threads online just openly mocking the OSR. Right? It's just a bunch of old people playing bad old games for the sake of nostalgia, which was never really the case. But these days, there seems to be a much greater understanding of it as a way of playing games and as a style of play that has a lot of value for the role-playing game community in general. So if we're talking about everyone who is not a current OSR player, the vast, vast, vast majority's opinion is that they've never even heard of it at all. If you take the remaining people, the majority of them, I believe, have heard the term OSR before and then they didn't really follow up on it. Of the remaining people, I think that most of them are vaguely like, okay, it's OS is for old school and it's some kind of old school movement or something. Even when you get into non-OSR playing professional game designers, this is where a lot of people still are. Now that slim percentage of remaining people who don't play OSR and who, but who know what it is and have an opinion of it beyond like, oh yeah, I don't have much of an opinion, but I know. I think most of them have opinions that are based on very personal interactions that they had with either an OSR group, an OSR game, or OSR fandom. And they're gonna vary wildly from positive to negative based on what their personal experience was. If people think that there is a majority opinion that's not kind of neutral or not knowing what it is, then that's probably focused on a very small number of um, responses. I think it feels a bit like some those that get it, get it kind of deal. And if you try to find precise information about it, you'll just find really confusing things. So a lot of us end up not actually getting it and we might just be missing out on something. Um, I think that most people probably won't have much of an opinion on it because they probably don't know what it necessarily is. If they do have an opinion on it, um, I think there probably is a kind of niche within a niche uh, that are like super adamant. They love it to death and they're freaking all for it. Meanwhile, there may be another probably another community where they're like, oh, no, I hate that type of old school games or like that style of play or maybe the setting or whatever the heck it is. Uh, this is just pure off of assumptions, though. <laughs> For the majority of the TTRPG fandom, I don't think they've ever even heard of the OSR <laughs> because it's a pretty small group to begin with. While it is hundreds of games, it's like half the people in the OSR community are just game designers, I think. Like, it could even be more, frankly. And it's it's more of like this artistic community of people playing each other's games. It's, it's almost how it seems. And then for people who have heard about it, I think their opinion hinges on two things. One, the, it's either they really like the idea of playing a weak character for a few levels because, hey, and this is me, right? I think it makes the game more tense. I think it makes it exciting and it makes it a little bit more of a survival game. I find that fun. And there's people who will hear this first point, the weak character bit, and think, not for me. I want to be a superhero out of the gate. I want to have character features that can like solve certain uh, problems right off the bat because that's the fun part of like building my heroic character. Cool. I respect that. And then the second group is people who really just, I think, have heard of it, but hear the old school part 
and just know that old school games had some problematic elements. Might get flack for that, but it's totally true, uh, depending on what supplements and additions you were working with. And so rightfully, they worry that they might not be welcome in, in the old school community, um, <laughs> but really I think it's like a misconception. It's hundreds of games played by all kinds of people and honestly a very artistic community playing and designing cool stuff. A majority of the TTRPG fandom, I think, is hesitant in exploring the OSR. I think there are two reasons for this. First, many players coming into the space are being introduced to TTRPGs through 5e or other fantasy games that aim to provide the big super heroic world-saving fantasy, and OSR games are not that. Fantasy presented in popular media has a heavy influence here. Many movies, TV shows, video games, and anime are many people's first introduction to the genre, with most of them following the super heroic world-saving fantasy formula. The OSR doesn't seem like a style of game that fits with a modern player's expectation of fantasy. The last reason is there unfortunately is a very vocal but minority group within the scene that is ignorant, prejudiced, and hateful. They attempt to gatekeep the OSR space from those of us who are in marginalized groups and allies who advocate for progressive practices in the TTRPG community and industry. While this group is a minority, they've been loud enough to put a stink on the OSR game, which is unfortunate because there are many folks out there making great games under the OSR that don't share their values or vitriol. Uh, what do you think the majority of the tabletop RPG fandom's opinion is of the OSR? Um, I would say positive because a lot of OSR, from my perspective, a lot of OSR people are really just giving giving away stuff. They're sending it out there for free or for very cheap because they just kind of want people to play it and experience it. And and it's a, it's a big hacker space of RPG design where people are like tweaking things here and there. Um, I guess there is that, uh, maybe this is what the question is fishing for, is the, the grognard example. But I don't come across that in online communities very much. Um, E, and I play 5e, and I play a lot of OSR games. So, there you go. Here's wherein the problem lies. Due to some small but vocal factions claiming to represent the OSR, it's possible to build a perspective that the movement is right-wing extremism and tabletop role-playing. So much so, it led to the joke of the OSR, meaning, oh shit, run. I was convinced that's all it was up until about 2021, thinking that the OSR was the most nerdy as fuck dog whistle that had ever been conceived. Now, these problems do exist. And it is true, there are bigots who claim OSR affiliation, but who's supposed to stop them? The bigots who insert their agenda in metal doesn't mean that all metalheads are bigots. Games Workshop famously had to make a statement against the actual Nazis in the Warhammer space, but they're a company with appointed people at the helm. The OSR isn't something that you can assign a political ideology to because it's either an artistic movement or a preference for old school games. Full stop. There may be some factions that claim to be OSR, but there's no central leadership within it, and for every one of these bigots, there's hundreds of OSR creatives who are either outspokenly pro-inclusion or that remain entirely apolitical and just make stuff. It's a thing that can be owned about as well as anyone can own Impressionism or Jazz. So, the Grognard. Okay, this word gets thrown around any time that the OSR gets brought up, which you even heard Jordan mention. The Grognard is a nostalgia zealot who has a taste for games made decades ago and tends to dog on anything newer without any real substantive argument. They won't tell you why these old ways are better, but they always will tell you that they are. This on its own is annoying, but we'd be overstating the harm to call this problematic. This is the only definition I'm personally comfortable with assigning to Grognard. When this steps into a teardown of inclusive ideals in gaming, it goes beyond Grognardism and gets into actual bigotry. If people just want to play old games, that's not a problem at all. It's when you dismiss everything new as woke garbage that you've now taken a political stance. I could go on about this, but that material distinction is really the only important thing I wanted to highlight right there, especially seeing as my script officially has more words in it than Shadow Dark's entire print book, and this video that started as an analysis of a cool game has suddenly turned into whatever the hell this is. So, in short, there may be some bigots who are grognards, but not all grognards are bigots. So in summary, the OSR is this acronym that could mean a few different things, and the overgeneralization has cast a disparaging light on it. Whatever you want to say it is, it certainly isn't a movement of anti-inclusivity, no matter how loud someone on either side of the political aisle wants to screech at you. With that, let's talk about the 5 e sized dragon in the room. So, the whole time I was sitting down with Shadow Dark, I kept thinking about how everything was way more intuitive and practical than D&D &D 5e. I realized midway through typing my review that 
I was doing more comparisons to 5e instead of just talking about the system in its own right. This bothered me so much that I actually went back through and rewrote the entire thing as if I was introducing it to someone who had never had a role-playing game in their hands. Seriously, go back and watch for yourself. I've seen TTRPGs that go so far as to never explain what it means by roll a d12 and operate on an assumption that, of course the reader knows, they must have already played a TTRPG. God, I love you, Merkborg, seriously, you're one of my favorite games out there, but you never explain that you even need dice, what the dice size names are, or that you're even a role-playing game. I get it, though. These games are designed with an assumption that the reader must already know this stuff because they've accepted a really sad belief in our hobby. No one will be interested in my game if they haven't played D&D 5e. Claritin details how and when to take it, not have you ever taken a Benadryl, it's like that. Bic still explains the features of the permanent markers without deferring to Sharpie. The board game Tapestry doesn't explain itself as Everdell, but for non-furries. They don't do this because it always undercuts the thing that they made and only hurts the consumer. Our hobby needs more inlets, but we keep killing accessibility in fear of failure. For example, at Gen Con this year, I got to check out the Adventure Time role-playing game from Cryptozoic. It was introducing its boutique Yes And system that looked like a fantastic introduction to TTRPGs for kids. I was so happy to see something like this considering the significant lack of low cognitive load inlets to this hobby. So it really sucked to find out that they felt that their thing wouldn't succeed unless it was yet another 5e supplement. We had just won one of the biggest anti-capitalist revolutions in tabletop gaming. People have never been more interested in checking out other TTRPG systems, and yet creatives are so bought into the idea that they can't flourish without 5e that they wind up creating this self-defeating loop. Here's a thing I really want to make. It needs money. Better make it 5e instead. I'm not saying people who enjoy 5e have inferior taste or anything. I'm just a fixer. I want to fix things. I want problems to be solved. Creators feeling like their own vision can't succeed because they're beholden to the whims of Hasbro feels like a problem. I have seen some commenters on my videos say that they're tired of the same old game they've been playing for years, and then I'll get a notification not 10 minutes later of that same commenter dogging on another game in a separate video for being a fantasy TTRPG in a market dominated by D&D 5e. If we'd hoped people would play our games, it sucks that we feel we have to say play this other thing first. We have to stop acting like we can only hope to feed off the scraps of the D&D fanbase and have more respect for our creative spirit. All that to say, Shadow Dark is a great game that emphasizes the need for more beginner inlets to the TTRPG hobby. Its higher lethality is a part of its roots, but this is offset by quick character creation and the ease of leveling. It wasn't so caught up in the idea of narrative integrity that it forgot how to just be a game. Do you have any idea how refreshing it was to see something as gimmicky as Shadow Dark's torch mechanic unafraid to be just that simple? When I got to play it, that torch igniting had the same effect as a DM putting an hourglass on the table, and I remember in 2017 when everyone was suggesting that as a DM tip for tension. You know what makes it like 5e? It's resolution mechanic. That's it. You roll a d20 and add a modifier, comparing the result against the DC. Every other aspect of the game is more accessible and intuitive than anything I could possibly compare it to in D&D 5e. Kelsey wasn't afraid to challenge the conventions that 5e had established, and decisions like this are all over this game. You don't add modifiers to damage rolls, and hit point numbers are reduced overall, leading to less calculations for any action in combat. Critical hits double the damage dealt on attacks, it has a cutback action economy akin to other OSR games, and I promise you, I promise you 5e fans, bonus action reaction emission is a really good one. Spells are checks to cast, rather than requiring any resource that you have to track, it doesn't just take toys away, it gives you new ones that you might find you actually like better. You can see the influence drawn from other games, but Kelsey's twist on familiar concepts and the ability to present them with a concise package is something to be admired. In a world where everyone seems to want to be a 5e clone, I would love to see more games dare to be a Shadow Dark.
God 